Welcome to all of it. We got all of it. All of it. <laughs> all of <laughs> it. <laughs> Our guest is Secretary Madeleine Albright. Brian Cranston. Tank and the Bangas. Barry Jenkins. Celia Keenan Bolger. Aaron Lee Carr. Esperanza Spalding. Gideon Glick. Helen Yoyemi. Fab Five Freddy. Benga Akanabi. Brene Brown. Tony Goldwyn. Tandy Newton. Jake Gyllenhaal. <laughs> Welcome to all of it. Thank you so much for joining us. Hello. What a pleasure. Hi. Hi. This is so fun. I'll see you tomorrow. We're here every day, 12 to 2. Impromptu concert. I love it. I love it. I was there for the love of it. You must tell the truth. I'm sure everyone's perspective is unique. There's a lot of truth about the pain of being an immigrant, mm. but they're jokes. We find the funny. It's our strength. At what point do you think women's health care will stop being a political issue? When half of Congress can get pregnant. Ran out of words, but we do what we do. We mm. don't have no words, so we got to trade twos. So we trade twos. I was just really dope groove. And Allison was so nice to meet you. <laughs>
Congress, both houses, and threatened everything about being Native people. I didn't know what he'd done, really. Really, I didn't know. At what point did you decide that you wanted to work this in to a novel? Oh, how, how did I decide this? I mean, what instantly came into my mind wasn't very admirable, really. I was having trouble with another book. I put it <laughs> aside and I thought, what now? And I started reading the letters over at that point. And I thought, this is what I'm meant to be writing now. And that's why the trouble is with the other book. Here's what I have to do. I know what's going to happen. I have, it's, I, it's, it's like, I've been waiting till I'm this age, till I have, I, I mean, on some level, there might be some maturity involved with it. I don't know, mm -hmm. but I, I, I really couldn't have done it before now. I had all of this material, but I couldn't use, I couldn't, I couldn't really grapple with it. You didn't have the life experience, do you think? I don't think or I you... had the patience to mm -hmm. put these things together. And also, um, I, I, I made friends with historians and they kept telling me, look at those letters, you know, and we went down to the National Archives in Kansas City um, and so here I have to just give a shout out to libraries and archives and people who keep pieces of history that are so granular, so fascinating. And um, once I started looking for my grandfather's school, I, you know, his boarding school, you've heard a lot about government boarding schools, perhaps he went to several government boarding schools and including the one that my parents taught at, he, he went to that school, right? So I was basically walking, not only going to visit him on the Turtle Mountain Reservation, but sort of walking through his footsteps as a child when I didn't really understand it. So I found out all these things about him from his boarding school files. And anyone who's Native American understands that the government basically keeps everything you ever have done in boarding school. Hmm. There's letters from him as a kid. Um, and contrary to what a lot of people think, like he really wanted to get into that school. Uh, times were very hard. And, and a lot of people went for the simple reason that people got, you know, three square meals, they got health care, they got everything. Mm -hmm. They didn't have to walk miles to school. So he wanted to be there. You know, one of our listeners and one of our book club members wrote to us on social media that they learned so much from this book about the boarding schools. They had, they had never known this. They had, didn't really understand it until they read this book. And I'm curious, you, because I have a similar reaction about some other things. Like, I didn't know what cage hotels were. I had to go right to Google <laughs> and I went down a rabbit hole and that was fascinating to me. Yeah, I, we don't want to stay there. We don't want it. We don't want it. No, no, no. But, but, just like, <laughs> but knowing that was interesting. Knowing that part yeah. of history is really interesting to me. So I'm curious, as you as a novelist, how do you decide how much of what you write is going to be about education, even though that's not your job? <laughs> and, and how and, and why not just put that on the back burner and go ahead and write? I honestly don't think about the education at all, because to me, these things are just fascinating and I want to know them. Mm -hmm. So I don't really think about whether other people want to know them. I'm just, my method of writing is a lot about engaging myself in a story. And I'm, I hope that if I engage myself, other people will come along with me. I did want to ask you, since you mentioned historians and how important they were to this work, can you help us understand what was going on in the country at the time of this termination bill? Yes. So this was, um, you know, post-war United States in which there was, you know, the baby boom, post-war housing boom, 
and the sense that we could really use those forests that are on reservation land. And we can really use, this is happening to this day, uh, the, the natural resources mm -hmm. uh, that are on reservation mm -hmm. lands. So terminating uh, American Indian tr uh, tribal nations was really about moving people off their homelands, off of our homelands, and seizing those homelands through, um, you know, what, what happened was corporations were lined up at the borders to seize those and the, those, those forests. So the Menominee and the Klamath were terminated first. There was five tribes, including the Turtle Mountain Chippewa. But we're, you know, had a, a small land base. So that really wasn't the reason. The reason was, you know, um, just to keep it moving. I mean, every single tribal nation was supposed to be terminated. So let's just move down the list. Hmm. In, in the book, when the introduction of the termination bill comes up, this passage is from your novel. So it comes down to this thought, Thomas, staring at the neutral strings of sentences in the termination bill. We have survived smallpox, the Winchester repeating rifle, a Hotchkiss gun and tuberculosis. We have survived the flu epidemic of 1918 and fought in four or five deadly United States wars. But at last we will be destroyed by a collection of tedious words. Why was this kind of legislation so effective and so frightening given the list in that well, passage? You know, this was, this was a personal reaction that I had. Mm -hmm. And that, that Native people know so well that our survival as peoples depends on collections of tedious words. You know, legal descriptions, land title, uh, all, sorts of, uh, all sorts of verbiage that really, when I read it over, I was like, how am I going to even get this in a book, right? Unless I have it through Thomas's eyes. You know, I didn't want to add a lot of that into the book. I just tried to keep it to a minimum because it's it's just a narrative killer, right? Mm. To put a, a bill into a book. And um, so so I, but this was a personal reaction. Um, yeah, all of the very, all of the vitality of, of peoples sucked into those um, Latinate endings, you know, those words that are mm -hmm. so repetitive and, 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 and so easily written out to erase people. Let's talk about your characters. You make a point on page one to let us know that Patrice, Pixie, is completely fictional. <laughs> <laughs> was she someone that you had had in mind before the character of Pixie and, and sh this was the right place for her, this book, or did she just arrive with the story? No, oh, Allison, thank you for asking that because she was a real out of the blue character. And I swear I knew her the minute I wrote down she did things perfectly when enraged. I mean, mm -hmm. I just knew this young woman. And I, she took off, she took off with the story and thank God, you know, I, it was very hard to write a real person like my grandfather, but she just came alive for me. Why does she wanna be Patrice instead of Pixie? Well, Pixie is too cute. And she says, well, I end up Dagazi. You know, she, she doesn't want to be that cute person. She wants to be the professional. And she's got a job. And this is mm -hmm. one of the remarkable things that is true about this book. At a time when women, you know, jobs were being taken post-war away from women. 
Women were useful during the war, after the war, go home and, you know, cook me something. And so she had this job and that was true about the Turtle Mountains at the time. Women really were the best at this particular job, this jewel bearing plant. My grandfather really worked there. And she wants to be, she wants to rise in the world. She wants to be somebody. Mm -hmm. She wants to, to, to be Patrice. And that to her gives her this, this sense of, of um, it's not even glory. It's just being a real person. A sense of being. Yes, a sense of being. Patrice and Thomas are both on quests in this book. Yeah. How are the quests, how did you think about the quests coexisting? They really just came together almost organically. I mean, I didn't really think about them so much as just follow them along. This was very much a character driven book that you know, I, I really loved writing it because so much of it was uh, basing a chapter on an incident. For instance, the boxing, that was real. Hmm. Um, the, 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 the tribe had to raise money to get people to Washington to fight this bill. How to raise money? I mean, people were dirt poor, had nothing, and still they were reaching into their pockets but people would come, boxing was huge throughout the Midwest. I was throughout the country. I mean, small town boxing, boxing um, matches were just a big thing. You'd get, I, I remember even um, hearing about heroes of the boxing ring when I was really little. And, you know, I had an uncle who fought in the golden gloves and that kind of thing. So, that's how they would raise money. Yeah. Set up a boxing card, set up a boxing match. So Patrice's quest to Minneapolis is to find her sister who has gone missing, Vera. And she's sort of kidnapped to, to this bar. Uh, and the owner convinces her to become a performer, to put on this blue water jack suit and swim around sort of seductively. Um, I. Did you see this anywhere? Did you, is that pure imagination? Well, there was, so um, there was this bar, I think, um, was it called something the Palms? And Davina was a mermaid who swam around in this bar. Um, it was in the seventies, but I, I brought it back to the fifties. I mean, this was down the street, basically, in Minneapolis. So I was totally fascinated with this idea. And um, it, she turned into a water jack because I love the idea of her turning into Babe the Blue Ox. I mean, she's really iconic around here. Mm -hmm. <laughs> Part of, as, as the story goes on, as she looks for her sister, Vera, it gets pretty dark yeah. um, and we really, you really investigate as you do in your work, abuse and exploitation of indigenous women. And this is interesting because I mentioned to a friend of mine who is very, very active in her tribe and actually runs the women's center that we were doing this. Yeah. And she wrote me something interesting. I want to read to you. Thanks. She said, because then she, we started talking about land rights and we started talking about all of this. And she said, the way the land is treated and how we have lost sovereignty over it is as the same as the way native women are treated and how we have lost sovereignty of our bodies. Those pipelines are connected directly to MMIW, missing and murdered indigenous women. It's mm -hmm. all connected, which is why Erdrich's books are so great. They are not just about one thing. They pull in our culture and ways of thinking to show the interconnectedness of it all. It is interconnected. And right now in Minnesota, we are in a state of real shock because our, our governor and our public utilities have um, 
opened up a way for this huge keystone type pipeline to go through the most pristine part of our state. And you know, we know that is going to result in profound abuse, not only of women, but this is COVID times. Mm-hmm. They're going to start basically tomorrow. It, it, it's really, it's really astounding, but absolutely. The way also, you know, women are, we are the protectors and keepers. We're responsible for the water. There's this saying that there's, you know, four spirits, four female spirits, one who, you know, who, who keeps track of the rivers and the, and the waters. There's one that, that looks after the oceans and the currents. Um, There's one who, who deals with the rain and the skies. And there's, one who deals with the water that we have to protect our babies and our bodies. You know, and this is why women, not only the land, but the water is so vital. And what, what happens with these pipelines is, of course, we've seen it over and over again. Everyone has seen it. You know, we saw deep water spewing poison mm-hmm. to our water. Water is our future. And, 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 and the way women are treated is the way the water is being treated. And this is our stand. We, and I know that Buffy is going to talk about this too. Mm-hmm. This is huge for, for our people. We asked our listeners who their favorite character was. Oh. One said Barnes. He oh. is in love and only has good intention. Hey, Stack. <laughs> <laughs> Another wrote in to say they were sad when the book ended because they loved spending time with all the characters equally, which is a lovely saying. Who was your favorite to write? You know, I, it was Pixie. I, I mean, mm-hmm. she would, she, she enjoyed in a strange way being this water jack. And I, I never knew quite how she was going to react to situations I put her in. Um, put her on the train and we all have been on a train and had someone just kind of uh try to take our seat or try to you know muscle in on us this is a it's not just that she is indigenous but she's a woman and how is she going to react and so i i kind of loved it when she like knocks the guy's hand away and feigns sleep and you know i i just like the way she would take scenes and run with them almost as though I was kind of playing catch up with her. I did want to follow up about Barnes though. I was curious what you wanted to explore about him being a white educator. Mm -hmm. Oh, well, I, I needed somebody who would kind of be a foil for the other characters. Mm -hmm. And, 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 I don't know why I came up with him. In fact, <laughs> I, uh, you know, I, I tried not, uh, after a while, when I kept writing about his hair and everything, Boris Johnson got elected and I thought, oh no, you know, I'm going to picture <laughs> Boris Johnson. But no, I didn't picture him at all. I thought he uh-huh. was like a fairly handsome kind of, mm-hmm. you know, uh, uh, and I wanted to capture that wish that a lot of people who come into contact with native people feel, which is like, he asks uh, Thomas, really, could I, could I join up with you guys? Could I, could I be an Indian, you know? And Thomas is a kind man and he says, no, but we could like you anyway. And he feels comforted by that. And he really has fallen for Pixie. At the end, I I thought he and Millie could make a nice pair because I wasn't gonna, you know, give Pixie over to any guy. You know, she had to be on her own. That's if you should say that because we asked our listeners about on Instagram about midway through the book where they thought Patrice Pixie should end up with Wood Mountain. Oh, if they should be together, and s- halfway through, seventy-one percent said yes. Really? Oh, said no. <laughs> yeah, yeah. And I think everybody watching this has finished the book, so we're not doing a spoiler alert. 
Did you know that Wood Mountain was always going to end up with Patrice's six sister, Vera? No, I really, I really went back and forth about this. I really did. Mm -hmm. And I thought they were together. And then, I mean, it was as though I was watching one of my daughters with um, a possible guy. <laughs> it just, it's so odd as a mother because, you know, you really get attached to the boyfriend. And then it's goodbye, boyfriend. And they're out of your life. So I felt that way a little bit about Wood Mountain, except that he, he ended up with Vera, which I think was the right thing. He, he loved that baby. He mm. really loved the baby. So that was good, you know. He was so sweet with the baby. Well, you know, that was such a good thing. Yeah. Yeah. Listeners, viewers, we're going to start getting to your questions in just a moment. So feel free to start putting them in. Um, in the novel, it's not obvious. It's not dwelled upon. But you do talk about alcohol and alcoholism. I mean, don't get into Thomas's history too much. We, we know that he doesn't drink now. How did you want to write about alcohol and alcoholism in this book? I, I wanted to make put it in because it's unavoidable. Mm -hmm. This is an unavoidable part of, well, it's, it's not avoidable part of life, you know? Uh, and, but it's, 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 it's so much havoc with native life and a lot of the despair of dispossession was falsely comforted, I think, by alcohol. And that became, you know, it, an enormous tragedy and it, it's an ongoing tragedy. So I wanted to talk about it, but I also wanted to show that, you know, um, you know my, my grandfather did, uh, as they used to say then, take the pledge, you know, mm -hmm. take the pledge and he, he remained sober. But it, what a struggle, what a struggle. And I was so proud of him to know that later on. Uh, and, and that didn't happen for everybody in the book. Let's go to some questions. Tim. Oh, Tim. Hi, Tim. Tim is a big book club fan. Hi, Tim. Uh, hi, Tim. Tim is great. Please tell us more about the use of the spiritual world in the characters' lives, from owls to best friends. At times, the characters seem to be teased for their superstition, and at others, the spirits are an enlightening motivation. Well, that's exactly what it, I mean, Tim, you really picked up on, I think the heart of it is that sometimes people will tease each other about their, um, I mean, Native people tease each other about everything. Anybody who has you know, been around or is Native knows, like, you get teased no matter what you do. And even the most um, sincere, solemn moments get a little bit of laughter. So uh, I'd say, I'd say that the, the Ojibwe God has a great sense of humor and that, that um, people, people are, are glad to be able to laugh. It, it, it really cures so much that's hurting in, in, in the soul, you know. Otterware says, wants to know about the description of the reading, translating and retyping of the proposal helps the reader to understand how overwhelming it must have been to the Turtle Mountain people. Yeah. I, well, that was this whole technical thing that, I mean, I started to grapple with this. We think really nothing of, um, you, you know, our, our technology now is so facile and so mm -hmm. Um, flexible when it comes to the written word but I had to go through this thing okay wait how did anybody even get a copy of that bill and I look and and you know then I went on these deep dives to look through what kind of copying technology there was and there really was almost nothing you know it was really if you had an electrostatic printer you had to be in a a, a very wealthy situation mm -hmm. corporate situation Mostly things were typed and retyped 
by women with carbon copies at typewriters. You know, when I started typing, I've been looking through my own manuscripts. I typed, retyped every single draft and used a carbon to, and then had to do that sort of erasing and paste everything that they were doing. <laughs> I could hardly remember it because it seemed so crazy. But yeah, it's not, you know, it, it was arduous just to get the information and to disseminate the information. Rowena has a comment and I'm gonna follow it up with a question. I loved how the women in this book are central to the story as they are in life, but in other stories, they are often relegated to supporting characters. So I wanted to ask about Millie because we didn't get a chance to talk about Millie who comes in towards the end of the book half Chippewa woman, a scholar who's raised mostly apart from the Chippewa culture. She says she'd hardly known her family and was as assimilated as an Indian could be. And people hardly ever recognized her as an Indian. So why did she firmly see herself as an Indian? Why did she value this? Why did she not long for the anonymity of whiteness, the ease of it, the pleasures of fitting in? Mm -hmm. What did you want us to take away from Millie? Well, that came out of, you know, that came out of my own struggle. My, my father is German and my mother is Chippewa. And, you know, I thought, why, why does it feel so terrible not to be with native people? Why does it feel so terrible not, you know, not to have that? that warmth and familiarity and sense of humor and everything that is culturally part of my world. You know, I would live different places in my life and sometimes I wouldn't have that. And I would feel this terrible missing, this terrible part of myself was missing. So I gave her that because I wanted to express what it was like. You know, there's, there's this great book out right now, The Vanishing Half. And I really thought, my God, how painful to deny that part of your humanity and your warmth and your connections and how cruel it is that our world, our society would almost require that of some people, you know? So I wanted to give it to Millie and to go through the steps with her where she finds mm -hmm. her back. Yeah. Vanishing Half was our September book. It, really oh, like, I wish it, what a good book too. Yeah, it was great. This is my random question, which didn't fit in anywhere in my question. So I'm just going to go for it now. Uh, at one point in the book, Patrice refer, refers to uh, uh, Emily Dixon, Emily Dickinson yeah. poem, Success, which again, sent me to go find the poem. Um, success is counted sweetest by those who ne'er succeed to comprehend a nectar requires the sorest need. Not one of all the purple host who took the flag today can tell the definition so plain of victory. As he defeated dying on whose forbidden ear the distant strains of triumph break agonizing clear. Why this poem? I think because she could see herself being that person, not particularly dying physically, but maybe dying to in a different way and yet feeling that there was something out there that she could hear and sense you know that was like a larger life and a a larger um understanding of of her own connections i mean i i assume that patrice is going to come home and be connected but have a sense of that larger life Robin wants to know, will there be a sequel? Oh, Robin. <laughs> Thank you. I have no idea. <laughs> Thanks for asking. This is an interesting comment from Carla. I love Millie's clothing choices. Really? Oh, I just loved writing them. And so this thing where she goes into um, what they call the bundles, this, uh, I used to do that with my family there was a, a mission um, type of garage shop that mm -hmm. the nuns kept. 
and you would reach into a bundle and you'd take out some incredible piece of clothing. And I'm still kind of a scavenger about clothing. <laughs> and um, I love that she was kind of fixated on geometric patterns, you know, for some reason. I just really loved that which that was her that was her thing, you know. Kate wants to know, can you discuss how Patrice happened to take that taxi on the person who was so connected to the underworld in quotes? Well, it was not a coincidence. That that guy was waiting mm -hmm. for young women, like native women who got off the bus. That was how it happened. That's how women are abducted and, um, and trafficked, exactly how. So he was waiting. And, and when, when she came in, you remember, he just like takes off with her. Yeah, no accident. Adrian says, love Thomas's haunting visits from his old school friend. Oh, Roderick, yeah. Yeah, from Roderick. You know, it was, it's interesting. I was sort of going back and forth. Does Thomas welcome those visits? Or is it, is it always, or does it bring up something difficult? Well, so this was all suggested by a few sentences in my uh, one of my grandfather's letters, oh. where he said he was so exhausted that he said, he dropped his sandwich and said, oh, like what? And then he looked up and he saw a little boy crouched on top of the bandsaw. And he saw this little boy very clearly. So it was just out of those sentences. And then I thought about his, his life at Fort Totten boarding school and about, I've been reading a lot about kids who contracted tuberculosis there. And, you know, it all came together from that. And I, to my surprise, Roderick became his own character. Shelby writes, there are so many things I truly love about this book. And especially when Thomas thought about his father, peace stole across his chest and covered him like the sunlight, that line, that specific line, what inspired it? My feeling about my grandfather. Mm -hmm. And during this book, and I had to go on a book tour. So this, and it was right in the beginning of March when, you know, we were all realizing mm -hmm. that this was going to shut down our, our world. I felt like he protected me in so many ways and that he was somehow there and that I wanted to tell this story for him. It, and the place I ended up, the last place on the book tour was the Haskell boarding school that he'd run away from. Oh, wow. That was the last place I was when on March 11th, I guess, when things just went boom. One of our last questions, I think, is a great sort of wrapping up-ish question. It is from, I can't remember who it's from. The question is, the question was, what do you want us to take away from this book? Maybe a sense of complexity of Native mm -hmm. life. I mean, <clears throat> One thing that is really runs through all through a lot of my work. I don't only write about native life, but I mean, obviously, you know, I have a mixed background, but this is so crucial to me that people understand that tribal nations are all different. There's 576 mm -hmm. and more here in the United States. And that and that um, you know, when you see um these very uh, limited views of Native people. That is not the truth. Native people and Native nations are so complicated, mm. so different one from the other. So the complexity and the laughter, you know, the humor, I hope that comes through. Did you by any chance watch the Macy's Thanksgiving Day Parade? No. What was in it? Oh my God, I hate to ask. <laughs> No. It was something a, good? It was something good. Oh. And they, for the first time, had a land acknowledgement. What? Uh, Wampanoag and Lenape. Land really? acknowledgement. Yes. What do you, what do you think? huge progress. 
this, whenever there's an land acknowledgement, I just feel, I feel very emotional about that. That this is this is happening, and for Macy's to do that, that's that's great. Thank you for telling me. With such a big mainstream national audience, oh, I thought it was kind of amazing. Yeah, everybody was was watching it. Everybody that you know out here, people were all watching it. I mean, it's part of part of um, you know. I know my parents are watching, mm -hmm. and yeah, that's great. That's yeah, definitely go check it out on YouTube. So I understand that you are a big fan of our musical guest tonight, Buffy St. Marie. Yes. Yeah. Uh, what is it that you like about Buffy? Well, first of all, she is, I feel like we're relatives because everybody in that whole part of the world is related. And, um, and the other thing is that there's this one song, Keppel Valley, that uh, is so close to me and so close to my heart that um, I play it for my daughters and we start crying. And also, my bookstore, Birchbark Books, we play it all the time when we need to be energized and to feel the love. You know, we start playing Buffy. So yeah. Well, so Buffy is Buffy is in Hawaii, yeah. so we had we had to talk to her earlier but she sent you this message, Louise. Hi, I'm Buffy St. Marie. <laughs> Hi, Louise. <laughs> I'm a big fan of Louise Erdrich. I think I've read all of your books. Uh, what I particularly love about reading your books is that many of, many of them take place in an area that I know really well. Turtle Mountain um, isn't that far from Pipots Reserve where a lot of my relatives come from in Saskatchewan. And just the way that you lay out your story just feels like home, I think, to a lot of Native American and First Nations people. Um, it's just so familiar. Um, your characters, the way they feel, the stuff that they go through that's uniquely indigenous. Um, it just really rings a bell for me. And I have many, many songs that come from the same area, the same concerns um, that could probably accompany your book. Um, hard hitting ones like My Country, Tis of Thy People, You're Dying, which is nonfiction, you know, it's just about the entire uh, tragedy, the entire indigenous Holocaust. Um, or happy, happy songs praising indigenous activism like Star Walker, he's a friend of mine. Or even going back to the 60s now that the buffalo's gone, which is about uh, termination uh, of uh, treaties, you know, the attempted termination of treaties unilaterally by the U.S. government, which happens from time to time. They keep trying. The song that I want to do you, though, is... It's not happy, it's not sad, it's both, it's right in the middle, and for me it's a real snapshot of where I come from, and in some cases where some of your characters come from, so. This is called, Still This Love Goes On and On, because it does. Sat beside a beaver dam and watched the winter grow. Ice was hard with little tracks appearing on the snow. Fog is in the valley now and all the geese have gone. Cross the moon I saw them go and still this love goes on and on. Still this love goes on. Once I saw the summer flowers turn the fields to sun. Up and down the mountainside I watched the summer run. Now the fields are muffled in white and snow is on the dawn. Morning comes on shivering wings and still this love goes on and on. Still this love goes on. In every dream I can smell the sweet grass burning And in my heart I can hear the drum 
and hear the singers soaring and see the jingle dancers and still this love goes on and on still this love goes on fancy dancer come up north to see some friends of his fell in love in a power town and you know how that is beaded girls and painted ponies turn your life around and now you're singing kiss i give you and i laugh on and on on and on and on and on and in every dream i can smell sweet grass burning and in my Always hear the drum and hear the singers soaring and see the jingle dances and still this love goes on and on still this love goes on and still this love goes on and on still this love goes on and still this love goes on and on on and on and on and on and still Louise, oh, oh you're crying! You're crying. Oh, of course, of course. That's that's so much. I, I never imagined. Do you want to send a message to Buffy? Because I know she's going to just... yeah, absolutely. Oh. All right. If I look at you, then I'm looking at Buffy, right? Thanks, <laughs> Buffy. <laughs> Buffy, you don't, you have no idea what your music means to me. You've lifted me up when I've been falling down. You've, you've, you've brought me to my senses sometimes <laughs> and you've brought people together. You know, I was just talking about how in our um, bookstore, when we're working hard, trying to get things ready, trying to, trying to collect our wits, we play your music and we play it for each other and we play it for love of each other. And, you know, I have a lot of native people working in our bookstore and, and I love you so much and everyone loves you so much in our store. And I've got to tell you, you know, there's this, this um, man who's, I think interviewed you. He's passed. He's in the spirit world. His name was Studs Terkel. And whenever we sat down to talk, he'd switch on Capitol Valley and we would both cry. He loves you so much. I, I just can't express how much my, my phone is filled with Buffy. You mean so much to me. Miigwech, ah, pidgigo miigwech. I really, thank you for for communicating with me that way thank you forever and louise thank you so much for giving us so much time tonight well my complete pleasure lovely to meet you thank you everyone who's watching for the questions and lots of love to everybody you know we're all, our, our spirits just need a lot of attention right now. And um, I thank you. Have a good night. Good night. We do have a great interview with Buffy coming up. For those of you who don't know, Buffy St. Marie released her groundbreaking album in 1964, It's My Way. And she told our colleagues at NPR in the first few years of her career, she had a little bit of fame, she had a little bit of money, so she wanted to put it to good use. So she started the Nihiwa Foundation to promote uh, education about indigenous rights. Throughout her career, Buffy St. Marie, who is Cree, has been talking about activism, has been talking about indigenous history, has been talking about indigenous rights, even at times when it may have not been beneficial to her career. She was black, well, she was black wasn't the right word. 
she there were phone calls made behind the scenes to keep her off of certain radio stations she had difficulty with certain people in the record industry but it never stopped her from speaking her truth i spoke to buffy earlier as i said because she's in hawaii and here she is to explain herself from her home basically the problem is that you know people have never truly been educated as to what the heck happened. Right. I mean, I, I mentioned the word genocide in the 60s in a song called My Country Tis of Thy People You're Dying. And everybody's, I, their attitude was, oh, the little Indian girl must be mistaken. Hmm. It was very, mm, the little Indian girl. Well, this, <laughs> this did not make me happy. <laughs> this made, this just clarified how much work there is to be done. Yeah, I wondered, but, you know, the, the Nicole Hannah Jones from the New York Times has made this incredible 1619 project that really talks about how the original sin of, sin of slavery is so integral to America being what it is and its growth and its economic basis. And there's all of these congressmen and senators who don't want to hear it and don't want to hear it taught in schools. What is it that you think people like that, why are they so threatened by hearing an accurate representation of American history? Beats me. I mean, maybe Robin DiAngelo or um, uh, Isabel Wilkerson, you know, maybe, <laughs> maybe they can say it more clearly than, than, than I can. Uh, but this is the reason why we write books is because we know that many times people of very good heart People who really, for instance, believe in their religion or, you know, just believe in just the kindness in the world, they and their families were involved not only in African-American, you know, the enslavement of African people who became mm -hmm. African-Americans, but most people have never heard of a book called The Other Slavery. And since this is the New York Public Library, you guys better underscore that. This is... Yeah. This is new information. Most Americans, most Canadians, most people have never understood that before there was ever a, a slave trade in bringing Africans to the Americas, we had already gone through a generation of Native American slavery, which in the 1800s, there were more Native Americans being exported than there were Africans being imported. And I'm not trying to compare. No, uh, no, I understand it can't be done. I mean, it's all horrible. But the thing is that this story hasn't been told until now, because yeah. the author, Andre, Andre Resendez, did his research in Spanish in Spain. Hmm. And the names, dates, and serial numbers are very clear. And I guess what I'm trying to say is that contemporary authors like Louise, and we have a there are a lot of there are a lot of Native people writing in both Canada and the U.S. writing in English um, for a wide audience, and they write about all different kinds of things. But what, what we have in common is that it all goes back to this incredible, heavy burden of history through which we have lived, and. I'm sorry, folks, if you don't like the word genocide, but mm -hmm. it's even worse when it's being done to you than when you're hearing about it. So it's not good. The residential schools, missing and murdered indigenous women and girls, mm -hmm. it's, all, it's all continuous from the 14 and 1500s. The enslavement of Native American, I won't even use the word, the Native American, mm -mm. The women, the women and girls were thrown to the soldiers as rewards. Mm -hmm. I mean, it's so horrible and it hasn't been addressed, but that's part of the incredible burden that Native people have been living under for, for generation after generation. Oh, there's another good book too. Uh, mm -hmm. um, Tamara Starblanket has written a, a rather technical, real, legal uh, book mm -hmm. uh, in her PhD. It's called Suffer the Little Children by Tamara Starblanket. And if anybody is really interested in getting down to the nitty gritty mm -hmm. of what the heck happened to Native American people, to indigenous people throughout the world, it was just plain okay in those days. Mm -hmm. Read the Doctrine of Discovery. I'm trying to get that doggone thing. I'm trying to get phrases from the Doctrine of Discovery projected onto museum walls. Because honestly, 
Black people, Latino people, white people, even indigenous people ourselves, we have no idea what the heck happened. And it's not only horrendous and horrible, but it's also really interesting to those of us who want to find out ways so that, you know, we, it can't keep on happening, genocide after genocide all over the world, just because somebody in power wants that to happen and the rest of us don't know how to stop it. Buffy, when did you first realize music was a great vehicle, a great delivery system to talk mm. about these issues? <laughs> I don't know. I, I've, I've made up songs just for play since I was about three. And there's, mm. I, I swear to you, there's no difference between me playing music and me playing Tinker Toys and I was three. It's the same thing. I didn't learn in school, et cetera. So it's kind of natural for me to, like you give a little kid a camera, they'll take pictures of their world. And so as a songwriter, I kind of take pictures of my world and my world. I mean, when I showed up in Greenwich Village and you know, I had just graduated from the University of Massachusetts, I had a degree in Oriental philosophy and I thought I was going to India, but I didn't get to go. Instead, I wound up in show business <laughs> singing songs that I'd been writing all my life. And the ones that have made me um, able to have a real long career are not protest songs. Mm -hmm. They're love songs. Up Where We Belong won an Academy Award. It's a love song. Until It's Time for You to Go that was recorded by Elvis and every, everybody. Uh, <laughs> it's standard, but it's a love song. But mm -hmm. things like Universal Soldier. And now that the buffalo's gone. My country, tis of thy people, you're dying. Bury my heart, it wounded me. And a real long list of songs are what you could call activist songs. But they're not all sad. I've got a song called uh, You Got to Run that's about, uh, yeah, maybe you ought to be running a marathon for breast cancer, or maybe you ought to be uh, running your own life, or maybe you ought to be running for election. But it's a big, powerful, positive song. And another one is called Carry It On. It's definitely an activist song, but it's activism for the environment. And um, mm -hmm. so in answer to your question, the long way round is that for me, what the song is about is just kind of, I don't know, just what I'm thinking about that day. I don't say, oh, it's time to write a love song. <laughs> <It doesn't, laughs> they pop into my head and I'm just lucky. And if I remember them, it's because I like them. And if I forget them, they probably weren't that good anyway. So tell me what the scene was like in Greenwich Village when you arrived. Our station is, you know, a stone's throw from, I'm sure, some of the places you played. <laughs> probably, huh? <laughs> oh, it was nice. It was good, you know, Greenwich Village was still kind of an Italian neighborhood with lots of coffee houses and um, um, uh, modest, but uh, somehow, well, I always thought Greenwich Village was very classy, you know, even mm -hmm. before the streets were clean in the morning. <laughs> has, I don't know, just maybe it's the Italian uh, Renaissance atmosphere, or maybe it's all that coffee. <laughs> but <there's laughs> a lot of people who like to have fun but most of all there were students and it was such a rare time you know it was a rare open window it was almost like it's a little piece of the internet because you could hear music about everything you could hear delta blues right next to um flamenco and then there'd be somebody singing a british folk song i mean it was just wonderful it was beautiful and then the window closed real fast right and things People smelled money. It got all genreified. Coffee houses all of a sudden couldn't survive without a liquor license. And so young people couldn't congregate anymore. I think it was a, a perfect storm and quite deliberate on the part of some people to kind of, you know, drown the movement a little bit. But there were mm -hmm. people caring. There were people um, uh, caring. As a matter of fact, you were almost expected to, there was almost an expectation, I think, for young people to, um, to speak up and to, mm -hmm. you know, to, to confront and to embrace what was going on. It was quite warm and fuzzy. <laughs> <laughs> when you think about how the music industry has changed over the course of your career, this is such a cliche question, but I bet you have a great answer. What would you tell young Buffy now? that you know about how to have a long career, how to, to think about your success? 
Oh gosh, that's tricky, you know, because I probably would tell her to do exactly what I did. I didn't mm -hmm. get too excited about show business because I hadn't planned to be there in the first place. So I, I've always felt like a guest. I've always felt like I'm on the periphery. I've always known that the big guys were not going to let me in. But um, in a way, all, I felt that way with no hard feelings at all because I had another life. I took 16 years off in the middle of my career to raise my son. I went from being blacklisted and the folk music people just hating me because I made the first ever electronic vocal album, right? Illuminations, right? <laughs> folk, folk, folk people did not like that. So I went from that right into Sesame Street, reached a whole new audience worldwide. Um, oh, yeah. Taught Big Bird about breastfeeding. Taught the count how to count in Lakota and Navajo and Cree. Um, oh, that's my generation. I'm that generation. I watched that. Yeah. I was born in 66. So you were, you were my people. You were my grownups. <laughs> that's, yeah, you know how it was then. Yeah. Um, so over the years, I just kept um, kind of living up to my own initial belief that, well, here I am all of a sudden on a stage in Greenwich Village with a guitar singing to people when I thought it was going to be in India. So I'll try this for a little while. And people just loved the songs. They loved the love mm. song, but they also not only tolerated, but embraced Universal Soldier and, uh, and my activist songs as well. So I, I kind of got away with a lot because I wasn't trying to be the center of show business. Mm -hmm. And by that, I mean, I went to Nashville and recorded with Chet Atkins and a lot of the people in New York thought I was crazy because everybody knows that anyone in Nashville must be a redneck. No, it's not true. <laughs> <laughs> uh, and and I, I, I played exactly the kind of music that I wanted to do, but the initial, um, the initial album of snapshots about my life has just continued to develop and been very multifaceted. Sad songs, happy songs, fast songs, slow songs, um, activist songs, love songs. And I just say thank you. I mean, because hmm. to me, you know, that, you know, I, I, went in, I went into Greenwich Village at a strange time. People were sticking up for things, but it was still, it was very white. I mean, it was very Woody Guthrie. Right. And people did not like the fact that I was not doing that. I mean, some people thought that's the way to be a folk singer. You know, you take off your shoes, you pick up a guitar and you play Woody Guthrie. You play, this land is your land, this land is my land. Or as Charlie, Charlie Hill, <laughs> the late great Charlie Hill, who is Oneida and Cree, by the way, Native American, mm -hmm. Charlie Hill said, yeah, this land is your land. It used to be my land. So people <laughs> right. like Charlie Hill, Floyd Weston, and Mommy, we weren't allowed to play in Oklahoma and Montana and South Dakota mm -hmm. where the big energy companies were. So most of my audiences were in places like LA and New York. Yeah. And who, nobody was going to invite me to, you know, to, who owned the newspapers? Who owned the TV stations? You know, who controlled the colleges and, and the theaters in the colleges? Um, it wasn't people like me and Louise and mm -hmm. Charlie Hill and, you know, so it was a different way of life than if we had been black or white or Latino, because, you know, everybody's perspective is unique. And mm -hmm. for Native Americans, it's hard because, I mean, you think of the white music industry and there are hundreds of thousands of people pushing the music, playing it. Um, promoting it, um, selling it, um, developing it, recording it. And the black music industry is huge. There's hundreds of thousands mm. of people involved. The Latino, we don't have one. The, uh, there is no Native American. There is no indigenous music industry. So, yeah, so interesting. Again, we feel like guests. We feel like guests. Mm. In Canada, though, it's different. In Canada, it's big. I want to ask you about the recent Macy's Thanksgiving Day Parade because there was a blessing and a land acknowledgement for the first time. Yeah, they had, you know, it was amazing. And, it, you know, that's such a mainstream event broadcast across the country. They had the members of the Wampanoag and the Lenape tribe and the blessing translated was creator and ancestors. We honor you for all things. We honor the Lenape people of Manahata. We honor all our relations because long ago we were here. Now we are here and we will always be here. And so it is. Very what nice. do you think about that? What do you think I, about 
I think it's terrific. You know, all over Canada, I don't think there's a public event anymore that doesn't open with some kind of land acknowledgement. And it's, uh, it's important in a lot of um, cultural and legal ways. It's important. But most of all, I think it's important in a, just in a, we can do this kind of way. I mean, for me, in spite of the weather, the pandemic and the politicians, there are still some people um, who are hanging on to positive attitudes, trying to look forward um, and come up with solutions that, that will last for five generations. It's not too much to say. And I don't know, it gives, it gives, even, even in these chaotic times, it gives me hope because I know so many people, you know, I'm privileged. I get to travel um, until the pandemic. I, mm -hmm. I was, oh, I was a terrible air polluter. I was in airplanes every day. <laughs> so um, just the fact that I've traveled around, you know, you, you see people who are loudly expressing themselves in negative ways sometimes. But if you look to the right and left of those people, you see people who are really kind of ready to get along, um, ready to continue to ripen towards, you know, toward tomorrow and better days. And, and so I'm not totally without hope. Buffy St. Marie, thank you for making the time and joining us from beautiful Hawaii. <laughs> <laughs> oh, my pleasure. And please give Louise Erdrick a big virtual hug from me. <laughs> She's the best. <laughs> Will do. Thank you, Buffy. Okay, Allison. See you guys. Aloha. Aloha. The great Buffy St. Marie. And I'm about to blow your mind. She is in her late 70s. If you think you need to know more about Buffy St. Marie and who wouldn't after that interview, you're in luck because in February, the paperback version of Buffy St. Marie, the authorized biography co-written by Andrea Warner will be released February in paperback. And earlier this year, Buffy released her own children's book called Hey Little Rockabye, A Lullaby for Pet Adoption. Thanks to Buffy. Thanks to the wonderful Louise Erdrich for joining us for book club. We're about to announce our December pick and it's kind of great and it's a twofer and it's special. Stay tuned for that. We do have to say thank you because we're polite around here. We want to thank our partners at the New York Public Library, Tony Marks, Andrew Medler, and Brian Bannon for helping get so many copies of Louise's book, The What Night Watchman, into your hand. Hands, the Green Space team, they put this on and make this look fantastic with all the graphics and everything. Jennifer Sachi, Cam Ricardo, and David. And thanks to the great producers who helped put all of it on, who make it happen, Megan Ryan, Jordan Loss, and Simon Close. Now to our December selection. This is special. You're getting a little bit of a tip here, people. Tomorrow, the New York Public Library is going to release a special list of 125 books we love, a set, it's a reading list, a recommendations for adults, teens, and kids about books that are about and based in New York. It's for their entire celebration of this great city. It's called Roar for New York. It's an effort by the public library. So we're gonna get in on that. So we have picked a book from the list. It, it's a modern classic. Um, maybe you missed it the first time. We are going to be reading Motherless Brooklyn from Jonathan Lethem from 1999. The story follows Lionel, a detective with Tourette syndrome, who works for the so-called King of Brooklyn, a mobster named Frank Minna. But when Frank is fatally stabbed, Lionel's world turns upside down. Motherless Brooklyn won the National Book Critics Circle Award for fiction. It was adapted into a film last year. You can borrow an e-copy from the public library. Head to wnyc.org slash get lit for details. Now, this is a twofer. Jonathan Latham has a brand new book out. It's called The Arrest, a story which takes place in a world where all our technology stops working. The New York Times recently reviewed it and said the novel is inventive, entertaining, and superbly written. Jonathan Latham will be on all of it on our show next Tuesday at noon to discuss The Arrest. So we'll talk about that book. And then mark your calendars, everybody. Thursday, January 7th, 2021. 
January 7th, 2021, Jonathan Lethem will just join us for a discussion of motherless Brooklyn. So follow us on Instagram at all of it WNYC for book club discussions and grab your copy of motherless Brooklyn and get to reading. We'll see you back here in 2021. Have a good and safe night.